Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to CSIS. Thank you all for being with us today. I'm Steve Morrison, Senior Vice President here at CSIS, at Director of Global Health uh, Policy Center and all the work that we do here. And a welcome to those who are online. Um, I'm uh, really uh, struck by the interest that this topic has stirred. In the, uh, it's a fairly straightforward objective here, which is to explore how the private sector advances global health. And yet the, the, the response has just been overwhelming and, and remarkable. And a testimony, I think, to the fact that this really has become such a vitally important dimension of what happens in global health in a vitally important constituent part of in, the, in America of what drives global health. And so we chose that, this particular topic, for the, out of that realization and also out of the realization that today in the current environment here, here in, that we have in Washington uh, where there is continued debate around the merits and the sustainability of global health engagement that it's really important to bring forward the private sector perspective and voice uh, uh, as part of the, uh, of the renewed debate around what matters and what value, what, what is most valuable uh, in, the, in, in this uh, world that we all live in and occupy every day. Um, we, are, we, are, we owe a special thanks today um, to Gilead Sciences for supporting us. Um, they're a very strong and very active partner of ours, and we're very indebted um, uh, to, to Gilead Sciences for the support that they've provided us. Uh, Courtney Gillespie has been particularly great partner in moving this along. She can't be with us today, but we have a very strong uh, presence here today from Gilead Sciences, and Greg Alton, uh, who you'll hear from in a moment, and you have his bio uh, in, your, in your hand. Uh, it's great to have Greg back with us today. I think we did a double header today with Greg. We were able to get him speaking on an uh, intellectual property panel earlier today. So thank you, Greg, for doing that. Um, Greg is a, uh, has been with Gilead Sciences since 1999, as I, re as I recall. So has lived through the amazing transformation that that firm has un uh, undergone. Uh, and continues to go through transformations uh, of its business and, its, uh, and the particular sectors that drive its business. Uh, and we got to become familiar with them and all of the innovations and expansions around antiretroviral therapies and more recently on hepatitis C. Um, they've been uh, uh, remarkably innovative and creative uh, in the way that they've gone about doing their business. We're also joined by uh, Randy Broyles from ExxonMobil, head of Africa Operations. Randy, thank you so much for being with I'm us happy to be here. today. And a special thanks to Jim Jones, a uh, good friend who helped arrange this, and Dina Buford, who's with us here today, head of the medical side of the operations of ExxonMobil. We've uh, had the benefit of, of Dina appearing several times in our program, and we're Delighted that we would have you here, Randy, as someone who uh, is really in the very center of operations in Africa, which are so hugely important uh, to ExxonMobil, to the energy sector globally, and to the economies of those countries um, where you're operating. Uh, one of the big points we're trying to make here today is that, in fact, those that have their their arms and their hands around operations of global businesses, whether it's Gilead Sciences, whether it's ExxonMobil, are the ones that are now the, the, the pro most prominent and important thinkers around how global health figures in the work that they do and where it sits. Uh, we're also uh, uh, very honored and, 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 uh, and delighted that Jeff Sturgeo is join, joining us today also. Jeff is a very a uh, dear friend of mine and of CSIS. He's a senior associate with us here. Uh, we've known him since he was in his days as a, as a VP for corporate responsibility and head of Merck's foundation uh, when, um, when he was in the, at the center of the negotiations that Merck engaged in uh, in, the, in in the early part of the naught decade around pricing 
and access for the antiretrovirals that Merck introduced. And subsequent to that remarkable career, he's gone on to head the Global Health Council uh, to be chairman of the board of the Corporate Council in Africa and to now be president and CEO for the last several years of Rabin Martin, a management consulting firm which cuts across many sectors and is really uh, the embodiment of the type of uh, creativity and intellectual aptitude that Jeff brings to these tasks of thinking strategically around partnerships, around uh, strategies of engagement by sectors, of navigating the, the complex environment of institutions that, that exist in this world of, of global health. Um, it's, the, it's one of our starting assumptions for this panel that there's been a historic shift in the last 15 years. And what I mean by that is that I think prior to 15 years ago, people thought of health if, in terms of global corporate, corporate activity, they saw it more as an add-on uh, activity. They did not see it as they do today as something that's linked to their core business operations and something that is true in low income as well as middle income countries. And, um, and that, the, uh, that not only is that shift happened cognitively and in reality, but also that the level of priority attached to health in the private sector operations has risen. And with that has come uh, the proliferation of many different partnerships across a diversity of settings. And as part of that has evolved, also a much closer interdependent set of relationships with uh, the US executive agencies that have, in the same period, dramatically expanded their engagements in the last 15 years in global health. So that what we have now is a complicated world in which the corporate sector exists, coexists, and operates with mutual shared interests with both the national governments, civil society, and executive agencies here in, here in Washington, as well as many of the international, key international organizations like the Global Fund, um, like um, a Gavi Alliance and others. So the private sector has become a major player. It's acquired mature relationships, considerable expertise and experience, and a complicated set of relationships um, over the years. So this is going to be a, over the next 60, 70 minutes, this is going to be an interactive conversation. We'll start with a couple of rounds of questions, and then we'll open it up to all of you uh, to participate. So I'm going to start now <coughs> by asking first Greg Alton to offer some of your reflections, Greg, on how Gilead Science has experienced the transformations <coughs> which have occurred in the past 15 years in the pharma sector. And what did you observe and, and discover in terms of what was required to be effective as a business of delivering safe, effective, and affordable medicines in an expansionary period? What did you learn and discover in that period? Sure, sure. Well, first of all, I want to thank you, Steve, for inviting me here and for the kind words about Gilead Sciences and obviously CSIS as well. It's not often we get to uh, you know, participate on panels like this and talk about sort of global leadership in, in, in health. Um, but just from, from, my, from my perspective, I think I speak for our company, I think there's, there's two things that go with that, and then I'll get to directly to your question. You know, I do think that there's a real moral imperative for us to do this. We, we create great science here in the United States and great solutions to health problems, um, and I th and, but people need the, that, that access to that health care everywhere around the world, so I think there is that imperative. I also think that there's a, um, um, it's good for our business, it's good for our, our, you know, our brand as the United States around the world to be seen as that company that, or that country and companies um, that are doing good work and are going you know, beyond sort of our personal interest in helping people. I think it helps us in, in, on the, in, in business, domestically and abroad. I think it helps our other businesses. I think it helps our government in trade and other, other negotiations and in, in fostering friendships. So I think it's, it's incredibly important and we just we hope that that continues um, for us because and we have experienced that over the last 15 years in terms of for for us we we, we see this through largely through the eyes of hiv aids because 
Um, as you mentioned, I, I started Gilead in 1999, and for most of the time I've been at Gilead, we've been primarily an HIV company. We do now have moved into viral hepatitis, and we're moving to other therapeutic areas, but that's <clears throat> really what we've seen. And I would say a couple things in terms of you know, what, what, what I think we have learned as an industry and what we've experienced is, um, and is you know, if, we, if you take HIV AIDS as an example, everywhere I go around the world talking to governments, they want health care for their people. And we can, we can debate about you know, good governments and bad governments, but in general, when you're dealing with the government, they really want to do something for their people. And, um, we as a, as a company in general, and I, th I think I speak for in Merck and where Jeff was, you know, we want to do something for the people in these countries, but we don't always know the answer. And I think one of the things that we've learned is, is if we listen to each other, if we be creative in our approaches, if we try to solve problems as opposed to avoid blame, I think we do a much better job. And I think that has, that's been happening a lot in our industry. And I think people are becoming more innovative. I do think we, we see a, you know, international markets, both as opportunities commercially, but also as, as places where we can deliver medicine to people. You know, in terms of what we've been, you know, we've been doing, we have developed a lot of partnerships with governments. But we've also, um, you know, something we talked about earlier today is, you know, I think that the industry has become much more um, um, aggressive in terms of things around differential pricing approaches in, in these markets. And then we've done a lot of generic licensing as well as Gilead, where we, for the poorest countries of the world, allow Indian, Chinese, South African companies to manufacture mm -hmm. generic versions of products for these, for these countries. And what we've learned is that you can actually do that and still have a very, very strong, viable business. And in fact, I think it helps your business in the end. It helps you with your relationships abroad, helps you with your employee relations. Um, and I, I think the question I have is, as you know, I think over the last 15 years, I think you know, we've, we've put roughly 18 million people onto um, HIV AIDS therapy in the last 18 years. And you know, I remember Jeff and I were early in this. Um, I never thought, I honestly didn't think we'd get here um, where we are because it was such a challenge earlier. I think where we're challenged is now, what, what, what can we accomplish in the next 15 years for other diseases, other therapeutic areas? Um, it probably won't be the same approach that we took in HIV AIDS, but if you come back to what I said before, which is if we listen, if we really put the problems in front of us and don't try to just, we're, we're, and it, it's gonna be hard, it's gonna be really hard, but if we don't simply say we can't do it, if we don't simply say it's somebody else's fault, I think then we can start to find some of the solutions. Thank you, thank you very much. Randy? If you could describe for us some of the changes that have unfolded over the years internal to Exxon Mobil, um, the largest you know, global energy firm with a very sizable employment population, employee population spread across the globe. What has this meant for you and where has health fit in that? Yeah, good, Steve. Uh, first, uh, thank you for the invitation to join you. Um, and if, if I were sitting out there, I might wonder what in the world is Exxon Mobil doing up here? Um, well, I, I want to answer that question for you. Uh, if you employ people, you care deeply a, about health. It is core to, uh, to our, our corporation. Many of you know we operate across uh, six continents um, as we provide energy to the world. Uh, and health is, a, is embedded in, in those businesses. It starts with the conventional occupational health. Uh, it moves on to primary care, uh, particularly in developing countries where there is not much primary care in, in small villages in West Africa in particular. Uh, infectious disease support, that's something that has gained traction that we've, uh, we've learned from uh, over the years. Emergency response, when something does happen, uh, being set up to deal with it quickly, professionally, uh, with a good outcome. And then uh, uh, promoting a culture of health. Uh, most recently, we've been trying to help others understand that uh, we need to own our, our lives and uh, think about our, our diets, our activity levels, uh, all in the spirit of, of retaining our health longer than in the past. Across the globe, we, we operate some 80 clinics uh, that support our businesses. Many years ago, I, I worked in Lagos. I had my family uh, with us or with me, and um, called Lagos home for five years. And we uh, we learned early that during the rainy season, malaria was an enemy. Our absenteeism uh, shot up, rarely for more than two or three days for an adult, but still it was significant. The losses that uh, that we that we had. Um, the tragic part of it was, of course, for young families, women who were pregnant, children who were 
ages five and below didn't fare so well. Uh, national adults develop uh, semi-immunity, some, some characteristics there that protect them. But children and again, women who are pregnant, uh, not, not so fortunate. So our, our people were uh, uh, dealing with tragedies every, every rainy season. And so it became more clear, we, what could we do? And we first reached out, uh, it was around prevention, helping people understand what's causing uh, uh, malaria in the first place. We, uh, we sponsored a malaria control program very broadly. It started small pilots and uh, we liked the results, but it, it was simple things. It was uh, 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 insecticide embedded mosquito nets because many people didn't have uh, air conditioning. And that, that made a big difference. Uh, clothing, clothing types were, were important. And the time of day that you're outdoors uh, was important. And then when you do contract malaria, it's about getting that early treatment. So again, I'm going back, when I was in country, this, the, these kinds of discussions were going on 15 years ago, but uh, we've, we've since matured it. What came out of that early malaria work is a broader initiative that, uh, that we call an Infectious Disease Control Steering Committee, which I sit on. And, and there's about 15 of us, very, very senior folks across the corporation for consistency, uh, across the globe, across our business lines, and it's embedded with some very good health professionals. And Steve said it, but I wanted to ask Dina to stand up. Dina Buford, just stand up very quickly. D Dina's our director of uh, medical and occupational health. Uh, we're office together in Houston, but she and her team provide the kind of support that we need to keep our, our businesses, our, our employees, and our, our families healthy. Uh, this Infectious uh, Disease Control uh, Steering Committee, it's again started with malaria, but it's taken on much broader uh, uh, responsibilities. I mean, yellow fever, cholera, uh, pandemic flu, and uh, of course Ebola, and, and more recently still uh, the <coughs> Zika. So I want to talk just a moment about Ebola, Steve, and, and uh, you know, as many of you know, go back to 2014, 2015, and started in Liberia, Sierra Leone, and, and Guinea in uh, extreme Western Africa. I think we were reminded that a threat anywhere is a threat everywhere. And it's, it's about education, it's about communication, and it's about awareness. Help. Uh, we, we needed to help people understand facts and fiction on, on Ebola. So we were watching it as it developed. We, uh, we tried to do some learning, sharing what we knew about the virus uh, early before it ever entered areas where we operate. And, and a few things, m many of you know this, but, uh, but a few things that were so important. First, no question, Ebola is highly contagious. It's carried by fruit bats first. It has a very high mortality rate. Early symptoms look a lot like malaria. They look a lot like common flu. It's spread through body fluids. That's really important. This is a nasty disease. It's a nasty, nasty virus. Now let me tell you the good news that came out of the science that helped all of us calm a bit as we, as we learned more about it. Again, well before the virus entered Nigeria, which is a major business for ExxonMobil. It's fragile. Ebola is very, very fragile. It is not transmitted by air. That's, that's huge. Weak chlorinated water kills the virus. Sunlight kills the virus. So we took all this information and we put it in a package. I, I called our senior leaders together in, in, uh, uh, in West Africa in particular, and we shared the information. And so it helped calm nerves, and then they took that information and continued to cascade it to our staff. They took it to their families, uh, really importantly, and started to share it with government officials, health officials. So as it worsened in Liberia, we were about to drip, spud a well uh, offshore Liberia. The easy decision was to pause on that, so we kept people out of arm's way. Easy call, no big deal. But then a fateful day, a Liberian national traveled on a commercial airliner, landed Lagos, who unknowingly was carrying the Ebola virus, and that's when things changed for us. O overnight, it's, it's in our face. And, uh, 
Thank goodness Dina and her team had equipped those of us on the, on the business line to, uh, to deal with it. But now we've got a very nasty virus in Africa's largest city, in Africa's most populous country. And ExxonMobil at the time had over 1,600 employees, not including families, not including the contractors that we hire day to day, and many were, were at risk in, in Lagos. As it turns out, this, uh, this gentleman from Liberia had recently buried his sister who died from Ebola. Now, the other interesting thing is uh, on that flight, no one else contracted the virus. So there was no body fluid exchange. Now, Nigeria, here, here, here's a great story, Steve. The Nigeria, in my opinion, helped show the world how to deal with Ebola. They, they began to, to mobilize every level of government, uh, whether it's healthcare or not. Every major industry came together with common messages, helping, helping to educate the, the millions of people that call Lagos home. Uh, so early education, frequent communication, the government was on that. And then once, once Ebola was confirmed, um, they developed a very effective tracking system. So those individuals that had interaction with, with someone who was carrying the virus was tracked for some 42 days, two cycle periods, two <coughs> Ebola uh, cycle periods. They uh, were measuring body temperature. And so as soon as you saw a little change in body temperature, that's when it's time to, uh, to quarantine and, and isolate that individual. Thousands of people were checked first in Lagos and nearby villages because people oftentimes wanted to go back where they were raised. And then eventually it worked its way to Port Harcourt that you may remember. We uh, internally, ExxonMobil, we have act, uh, activated our emergency response teams. I was leading the, uh, the group in Houston, but we also activated in each of our countries, not just Nigeria, but Equatorial Guinea, Chad, and, and Angola. We did a lot of, as part of that uh, exercise, we did a lot of worst case scenario planning which uh, was, was very helpful. Uh, it, it helped keep us in front of this, this, uh, this virus, should it worsen. We, uh, we identified uh, isolation areas, we did decontamination areas. We, we worked with the Baylor College of, of um, um, Medicine to uh, bring six individuals in country to train the government, to train industry on, on how to respond and contain uh, the, uh, the virus. But in short, unprecedented collab collaboration between not just the industry, not just our company, but with the government. That was so important to Nigeria successfully handling the, the crisis. There, was, uh, there, there were heroes, and, and one that you may have read about, I, I, I've got to mention her name, uh, a doctor in a Lagos clinic had, who had diagnosed this first case of, of Nigeria that, that uh, entered from Liberia. She, uh, she put herself in harm's way when he was insistent on leaving and she wouldn't allow it. Uh, Dr. Ada Debo, uh, and regretfully she lost her life because she was not, she, she didn't have the, uh, the gear uh, in the clinic to uh, protect herself. But a uh, really important uh, hero example. And I think in short, in closing, Steve, my, my remarks, uh, Global health issues are bigger than ExxonMobil. They're, they're bigger than all of us. And to have a, a chance at making a difference, for us, it's very much about partnering and collaborating with each other, uh, governments, NGOs, uh, other industries, and, and certainly education institutions. And I'll just close with a, a statistic. I, I like science. Science brings peace and calm. Um, when you think about where we were with malaria, as an example, in 2000 versus where the, the world is today, 20, or, or it was in 2016, malarial fatalities have reduced 60%. 60%, think about that, that's thousands of people, good people. And interestingly, over the same period of time, 70% improvement in children under the age of five. So I, I, we just think that's huge, and we think that's just one small example of what we can do when we collaborate and work together. Those, those are a few opening Thank thoughts, you. Steve. Thank you very much, Ben. Um, it is remarkable how many conversations you have 
where <coughs> the profound impact of Ebola registers with people to this day and, and is still so vivid. Um, we have some people here with us today, Laura Holgate's here, who, people who were on the front lines within the last administration in, uh, in, in, in uh, responding. Um, we put together a, uh, uh, about a year and a half ago, a uh, documentary, 33 minute documentary on how Ebola was uh, experienced here in the United States and what were the factors that drove a certain hysterical, uh, a panicked response, but what were the factors that, that brought back trust and confidence and stability. And, and those lessons are still very much with us. It was not just in, Ni in Nigeria, Lagos, and, and in the Delta where there were knock-on additional um, infections. It was something Dallas, that, Texas. Dallas, Texas. We went to Dallas and uh, did interviews with Clay Jenkins and with the doctor, Dr. Liddell at Texas Presbyterian and, and others. Um, and it was, a, it, was a, it was a very moving experience, but something that I think lives with a lot of Americans. And so I'm glad that you brought that up. Uh, Jeff, you've had a remarkable and varied c career, and the work that you do at Raven Martin cuts across many different sectors and <coughs> puts you into uh, numerous different conversations. And you've got the long perspective on this, too. Like Greg, having sort of lived through the transformations that. Mm -hmm. And the, and the sharp escalation of engagement and commitments in the not decade up through today. So as you look back at these transformations, what are your major observations around the way that health figures in the private sector, the prior, level of prioritization and emphasis? And, you know, what, what do you see looking back? Sure, well, let me... Um step back from some of the examples that Greg and, and Randy have given you and talk generally about some of the trends we've seen in the last 15 or 20 years. Um, I'm reminded actually of how much things have changed. Um, one of the, uh, I remember a conversation um, that was probably 20 years ago when I went to visit um, WHO Euro in Copenhagen when I was working at Merck and we'd been collaborating with some of the people at, at Euro on uh, some work around health targets uh, but I was introduced to the, uh, to the <coughs> deputy director for management, who was the number two person at Euro at the time. And I still remember, I was ushered into his office and introduced, uh, and uh, he was a Russian who um, uh, you know, was from the old school. And his first question for me, and actually his only question for me, was, who are you and what do you want? Right? So that was one approach to the potential collaboration between the private sector and uh, and the public sector, in this case WHO, 20 years ago. Um, you know, now things have, have really turned full circle, and we've heard two terrific examples in both Gilead, a leading healthcare company, and ExxonMobil, uh, a leading energy company, but, uh, you know, which you wouldn't think offhand would have interest in health, but Randy showed us quite clearly why that, uh, why that isn't the case. Um, but something else that occurred shortly after that episode at WHO Euro um, was that Gro Harlem Brundtland, the new uh, director general of the WHO, uh, put together a commission on macroeconomics and health. Some of you may recall the work of that commission. Uh, it involved people like Richard Feacham and Jeffrey Sachs and uh, a number of other leading economists. But at the time, the very idea that WHO would study the impact of macroeconomics uh, or the interactions of macroeconomics and health um, was something that seemed strange and needed explanation because um, that wasn't what most people at the time thought about when they thought about global health. But I think one of the biggest changes in outlook in the last 15 to 20 years is the notion now, partly as a result of the uh, deliberations of the commission and much work that has gone on since, uh, there's a growing understanding that health and wealth are inextricably linked. Uh, and so that helps understand why we're here for this discussion today, because it's not just that the private sector um, has expertise and resources that can help with this or that global health problem. It's also that having a healthier world is important for what business does every day. 
uh, because it means that uh, people will have the ability to take advantage of educational opportunities and be productive in their jobs. Uh, it means that countries' uh, development and trade um, uh, will uh, you know, be able to move beyond cycles of poverty and political instability that come with that because healthier populations are wealthier populations. Uh, and then in the broadest sense, that means that uh, those healthier populations are also able to contribute to the work that businesses around the world are in business to do, namely provide products and services uh, that help them achieve uh, their goals. That insight is at the core of Global Health 2035, the Lancet Commission that was uh, chaired by Larry Summers. Uh, it's also at the core of universal health coverage, which is one of the key targets in the Sustainable Development Goals, which were adopted by the UN two years ago. Um, so that's the first point I want to make, just that health and wealth are so interconnected uh, that the private sector clearly has interests in and a role to play in helping to achieve better health. Uh, the second is that, uh, and this comes from just about uh, everybody you ask these days, um, business clearly is going to be a key partner in achieving the Sustainable Development Goals. Now there's lots of evidence um, for this, but let me just give you a couple of examples from last week when uh, a number of people were in New York for the UN General Assembly. And so I just want to offer you a couple of quick vignettes from the General Assembly and the surrounding events last week. Uh, President Trump um, got a lot of attention for some of the things that he said in his speech to the General Assembly. But um, unfortunately, from our perspective, one of the things that he said quite clearly didn't get much attention by the global media. And that was um, he announced uh, support for PEPFAR, for the President's Malaria Initiative, and for the Global Health Security Agenda. Uh, and so that helped answer a question that many of us uh, were asking, uh, will the Trump administration continue to build on the leadership that the U.S. has had for many years? Uh, and uh, Secretary Tillerson announced an acceleration of the PEPFAR program in 13 countries. Uh, Mark Green, the administrator of USAID, announced an expansion of the President's Malaria Initiative to four new countries. Uh, and the Global Health Security Agenda, which he also talked about at the meeting he had with African heads of state, uh, is working very closely with 54 other countries around the world to deal with things like pandemic preparedness so that the next Ebola epidemic or the next Ebola outbreak doesn't catch us so much by surprise. Um, there was also uh, the announcement of a new initiative uh, called the Fourth Sector Development Initiative uh, in which companies are now beginning to look at um, how they can both have profits and purpose. Um, actually, if we have time, I'd be glad to discuss um, that uh, way of describing the issue. I think it kind of misses the point, but, but the point of, of this initiative is that there is much more interest now in having companies from many sectors um, really try to combine social impact with business impact. Um, there was a, a big announcement in HIV where Myelin and Aurobindo, uh, two generic pharmaceutical companies, had now reached an agreement with UNAIDS, Unitaid, DFID, the Gates Foundation, um, and others uh, to bring a new combination therapy for HIV to the world for $75 a year. Um, you know, when Greg, Greg was talking about some of the work that he and I and others were involved in uh, close to 20 years ago to first bring the first generation of HIV treatments to the world, the average cost was something like ten dollars to $12,000 per patient per year, and now we're talking about a much more effective triple combination therapy uh, that uh, will be available for $75 a year. So just, you know, that's part of what's driven the growth in, uh, in treatment coverage for HIV, uh, and that was just one of the announcements made last week. And then finally, the last example is uh, that the, um, the Minister of uh, Foreign Trade of Kenya hosted a meeting with a number of other partners for a new uh, SDGs platform for primary care in Kenya that is uh, an effort of the Kenyan government to work with their partners both within the UN and private sector partners like Medtronic, Philips, and, uh, and uh, Merck and & Company, and GSK to really bring together all the resources that are available in Kenya to improve primary care, and through that, they'll be able to improve a number of the uh, uh, different interventions they have in both infectious disease and non-communicable disease uh, to improve the health of the population as a whole, which will have a tremendous impact on Kenya's ability to reach the other uh, sustainable development goals. So those are just a few of the ways in which um, business is being seen as an important partner uh, in, uh, in 
helping to achieve the sustainable development goals. And by bringing a market-oriented approach to these challenges, uh, uh, we see opportunities for new enterprise, new employment opportunities uh, for individuals, and it applies to both health companies and non-health companies alike. The third point I wanted to make is that the business of global health is expanding. Um, if you think for a moment about, uh, we've been talking about different healthcare interventions and how to deliver them, but just step back from that for a moment and think about the economic impact of all of the companies around the world involved in providing healthcare services and healthcare products and technologies. Right now, the estimate is that this health economy is about $10 trillion a year. Um, and this has uh, an important economic impact, but more importantly, um, you know, it is improving the health of tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of people. Now, of course, it's not evenly distributed. Not all of that $10 trillion is in Africa by any stretch of the imagination, uh, and probably not enough of it is. But at the same time, if you look at it slightly differently, in most countries in the world, something like 50% of healthcare is provided through private providers. Uh, and in Africa, at least, uh, the estimate is that healthcare is financed uh, by, the, by private sector sources at about 60% of the total. And those numbers vary from region to region. In some, they're much greater. Uh, in a country like Thailand, it's much more public provision than private provision. Uh, but in a country like Nigeria, which you mentioned, it's much more private provision than public provision. Uh, but if we combine those two points, that there's an enormous economy devoted to health, and then in many countries in the world, people are already getting most of their health care from private sources, then uh, you know, this shows us the opportunity there is for the private sector to help improve health outcomes uh, and then improve uh, the social value that comes from investments in health. And if anything, that's going to increase over the coming years with urbanization and the risk factors attendant to that, uh, with aging populations, uh, with pollution and occupational exposures, the challenges to health are going to, to be there, and that creates new business opportunities, which we'll certainly have a chance to talk about. And then the fourth point I wanted to make is just to say that, you know, as governments globally look to achieve universal health coverage, um, they're going to be uh, trying to do that to meet the growing expectations of their citizens, and they're going to be looking for partners, both among civil society organizations, as I look around the room, there are folks who lead a number of uh, leading NGOs here, and I know many of you are involved in uh, helping to provide uh, healthcare services in the countries in which you operate, and they're also going to be looking for partnerships with businesses. Um, now, you've already heard about some of those examples, but I think these kinds of partnerships are really becoming increasingly important mechanisms to share, share expertise, to mitigate the risks of the investments that are needed, uh, and to achieve ambitious outcomes. And I'll just give one example uh, and then uh, uh, hand it back to Steve for the rest of the discussion. But a good example of the way in which uh, these partnerships are now um, developing is one that comes from work uh, in Senegal on something called the informed push model for providing contraceptives and other reproductive technologies. Uh, before this work began, Senegal was using um, you know, a fairly standard method for delivering uh, healthcare um, uh, medicines and other technologies with a centralized medical store. So it was all in government hands, it was run from the capital, uh, and there were 1,400 health facilities around the country who were the, um, uh, the recipients of the materials that were sent from the central store. Uh, it turned out that this was not the most efficient way to do it. In fact, stockouts ran at about 80% on average. Uh, so when women went to their facility to uh, get, uh, you know, an implanted contraceptive or just to get a, a pill or, uh, you know, other technologies that they needed for contraception or family planning, m chances were that four out of five times they just wouldn't be able to get what they needed. Now, through a partnership that involved the government as the leaders, but also involved Merck for Mothers, the Gates Foundation, uh, IntraHealth International, Imperial Health Sciences uh, and some other partners as well, they were able to transform the supply chain for reproductive com commodities in Senegal in fairly short order. And by outsourcing the supply to third-party logistics providers like Imperial Health Sciences and using what they called a mobile warehouse that was uh, software that enabled people to go to health facilities in the most rural areas check what was on the shelves, find out what was needed, and send that information back immediately uh, to a central database. Within six months, the stockout rate went from 80% to 
uh, and it also saved about a third of the cost of distributing these, uh, these products. So that outsourcing was successful because the government um, was able to put together this partnership with complementary skills and resources from the private sector, from uh, civil society, uh, and outsourced a function that they really weren't in business to do. It wasn't something that you would expect governments to be good at. Uh, but they were able to um, do this by putting in place the right kind of contract management um, facilities uh, and accreditation of the, uh, of the providers who they were working with. Uh, and as a result, uh, it, it was so successful that they've now decided to transfer uh, most of the health commodities that they were distributing through the central medical stores to this system. Uh, and there are opportunities to then uh, not only expand it in Senegal, but to bring it to other countries in Africa. So that's the kind of, uh, of multi-sectoral partnership that I think is really changing the opportunities uh, for global health. Uh, and it's happening, as I said, at a time when uh, we see more and more opportunity for the impact that these kinds of uh, partnerships can have on helping countries to achieve universal health coverage, which in turn will lead to a healthier, but also a safer and more prosperous world, which brings us back to global health security and why it's in the U.S. national interest to uh, encourage this kind of investment. Thanks so much, Jeff. Um, I want to turn our attention for a few minutes to the question of the partnerships that have formed from private sector with U.S. executive branch agencies. This is very important, I think, dimension of what has unfolded over these last few years. And I'd like to speak to and start with Greg, sort of give us a few examples of of these and, and w what the value has been and how have you sustained them and why did you even enter into these? Sure, sure. So I'll give you three examples um, of three different disease areas and three different um, st actually stages and branches. Uh, so first we, we spoke about um, Ebola <clears throat> earlier and when the outbreak first occurred, um, obviously there was a huge amount of concern globally about what, what could, could transpire. Um, Gilead has significant libraries of antivirals um, because we have a lot of products that or molecules that don't become products, they fail, and they quote unquote go on the shelf. Um, one of the areas we've been very active in, I say active, we've been trying to come up with um, uh, treatments for RSV. And we haven't yet, we keep working on it, and hopefully we'll eventually have one. But with that, the, the RSV virus has a target very similar to Ebola. Um, and so our scientists said, hey, why don't we take a look at our library? We can do some screening and try to identify some molecules that could, could target the Ebola virus. Now, studying Ebola is not the easiest thing in the world um, because, well, we don't have access to the virus, but USAMRA does. So we actually started a collaboration with USAMRA, which is the U.S. military research institution. And um, they have the vectors and they have the, you know, the live virus and actually the animal mo models to do this type of research. So we collaborated with them. And we've actually identified a molecule that has now been used on an emergency basis on two different individuals, one the guinea baby and one the Scottish nurse successfully. And we are now proceeding into, we're ready for clinical trials if, and we're actually now going to be looking at studying um, mostly men who have been cured but may have some residual virus um, because there is still the virus mm -hmm. shedding in that, in that population, but then be ready should there be another Ebola outbreak with a treatment, not a vaccine. Now, we do, a, vi a vaccine is ultimately what we want, but we think actually the two would actually be very important. So I think mm -hmm. that's one very good example of where we have been able to partner scientifically. Another area is, is with PEPFAR. So PEPFAR, is, I think most of you know, is the President's Emergency Response um, for AIDS Relief, um, which is primarily a funding vehicle for health systems and treatment for HIV. But we've actually partnered now with PEPFAR, and other, other companies have as well, around um, a um, uh, um, new medical intervention called PrEP, or using uh, medicine to prevent infection with HIV. And it's actually a medicine that we developed in collaboration actually with mm -hmm. the CBC, CDC and some other institutions. Um, but um, what the idea is actually to see if we can work with um, the PEPFAR programs to use pre-exposure prophylaxis in um, young women and girls in sub-Saharan Africa, which are one of the most vulnerable populations in the world, and sort of part of the cycle, we believe, in the, um, the, the continued incidence of HIV in sub-Saharan mm -hmm. Africa. So that's another partnership we have ongoing. We hope the data will come out and really show not only can you effectively prevent HIV infection in this population, but it can actually help stop a cycle of, of, of new infections in, in the area. <clears throat> Another area that we've, we've partnered is around um, hepatitis C. And um, 
the CDC has a very small um, um, <clears throat> hepatitis uh, group, and they um, really came to us. Or, you know, we were at, it's hard to say like who came to who, but we were at, a, at, at the EASL conference, which is a large uh, liver disease conference. And um, they do a lot of work in the Republic of Georgia, which uh, has a lot of um, strategic um, 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 uh, importance to the United States. Um, in fact, if you go to the Republic of Georgia, you, the first road you drive on is the George Bush Highway, and there's a statue of Ronald Reagan in the middle of town. They, they, they credit us with saving them from the Soviet Union. Um, but um, so, but we, we we're introduced to Georgia. They have a very, very high rate of hepatitis C in Georgia. It's probably, depending on, on who's counting, the third or fourth highest rate in the world, but it's roughly between 5 and 10% of the population is infected with hepatitis C. And what, through discussions that we had, this was with the CDC, Gilead, and the Republic of Georgia, we learned that you know, they have a population of about 5 million people. It's a fairly contained population um, ge geographically and, and, and culturally. <coughs> uh, um, hepatitis C has a number of different um, uh, genotypes. They have multiple genotypes, multiple modes of transmission. They, it's, an, it's, it's a bloodborne disease, so then they have transmission from injection drug use. They have transmission from tattooing. They have transmissions from unclean medical procedures. And um, what the CDC said is, look, we can do a lot of the epidemiology for you. We can create the baseline about what the level of disease is. Um, you, Georgia, you need to put your resources in and do awareness campaigns, and you need to do screening campaigns. You need to do prevention campaigns and about cleaning up the medical procedures and, and others, and, and um, be committed to treat your entire population, which includes, importantly, um, corrections, people who are, who are in and out of jail. Um, and in Gilead, our role would be to, we provide funding and as well as um, free drug for the program. And then out of this, we can really, hopefully, really determine um, what it takes to eliminate viral hepatitis or hepatitis C in a, in a population like Georgia. And we believe that um, if we can do that, then we can, we, and with the data that we're going to get from CDC, really use that globally mm -hmm. to, to bring the, the concept of, of, of elimination. Um, so far, it's going well. We're treating you know, 20 to 30,000 people um, per year right now through this program, and so mm -hmm. hopefully we'll see in five to 10 years that um, you know, George will go from a very, very high rate of hepatitis C to, um, to elimination. So that's another great program that we have with Thank uh, you. The government. Thank you. Randy, by definition, I expect the part, kind of partnerships that would be formed in an energy firm with executive agencies would be quite a bit different than what we would have heard from uh, from Greg, tell us a bit about the partnership. Yeah, yeah, I'll uh, I'll start there. And uh, Dina, you may want to help as well. When I think about the question that Steve was asking on c the current administration, the CDC, I'm very familiar with, but you're much closer to some other examples. But but I I would say that uh, I, I mentioned a few the the, the our in-country medical and occupational health team uh, in general have a very good relationship with the equivalent of the CDC uh, in, in each of these countries. And as the threat, the Ebola threat, reared its head in Nigeria, that's where those relationships were really important. They were very receptive to this, not, this idea of educate, communicate, raise awareness as quickly as you can. They, were, they took that on like a sponge. And, uh, and so that's, that's part of it, this, this partnering and respectful collaboration. I mentioned the example of finding, we, we, we ran several traps before Baylor Medical Center ag agreed to uh, join us in, in helping raise in-country awareness, in, in educating uh, healthcare providers in, in Nigeria. Uh, so that's, that's an important uh, partnering uh, industry. We were sharing real-time data in-country uh, with, with other, uh, certainly in, in the oil and gas industry, but, but beyond, uh, other, other businesses, be it banking or, or elsewhere, as we, we tried to raise that population of 15 million people so that they understood the, the facts and the fiction associated with, with Ebola. And, and so, Dina, with that kind of broad background, are there other examples you'd like to share from a U.S. perspective? In, depending on the country um, and depending on the, the situation. So one of our major partnerships is uh, PMI. Um, we've done a lot of work through, through that partner. 
Um, you mentioned the CDC in various capacities, including Ebola, uh, but also uh, linking uh, arms with them on education efforts. Uh, International Medical Corps is, a, is another partner uh, that, we, that we had. So the list goes, goes on and on. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I want to ask a question around, this is kind of leaning in the direction of, of uh, trying to influence behavior here in Washington and set impressions. Uh, and I'm going to ask Jeff to kick off with a few minutes of comments on this and then uh, Randy and Greg, and then we're going to open up the floor for discussion. And my question is, um, <coughs> What can and should the private sector do to make the case uh, for sustained uh, U.S. leadership in global health? I mean, the, the transformations that we've seen happen in the last 15 years, you can make the case that the sine qua non of all of those major changes was high-level sustained U.S. leadership in both executive and Congress particularly emanating in the executive with very strong bipartisan support. And much of what you've described as the dramatic gains do come back to U.S. leadership. The private sector can be very much uh, at the forefront of generating those changes, but it's riding, on a, it's riding on a historic wave that began to emanate uh, from Washington, you can argue, and then radiated. And, and, and motivated others and, and inspired other institutions to sort of jump on board. Jeff, can you say a few words? Oh, sure. I, well, first, I completely agree with your point that um, you know, what the sea change we've seen in global health over the last 15 to 20 years has largely been driven by U.S. leadership. And the other point that you made, I just want to emphasize, is this has traditionally been bipartisan leadership. Um, you know, for instance, um, you know, as, as Greg and Randy were talking about some of the examples of the kind of partnerships with different agencies in the U.S. government, I was also reminded that, you know, two of the leading agencies among bilateral donors for the kind of partnership with the private sector are uh, both, well, PEPFAR is not an agency, but PEPFAR as a program and also USAID uh, actually began under uh, the Bush administration when Henrietta Ford was administrator, uh, something called the Global Development Gateway. Uh, which was an effort to bring the private sector in as partners on a wide range of areas that USAID was operating in, not just health, but food and uh, you know, uh, democracy building and other, other issues that, uh, that they were involved in. Uh, and those partnerships uh, became very important and the basis for a continuing uh, effort on USAID's part to work closely with the private sector. Now, you know, of course, you could expand that and point out that much of the way in which USAID implements their programs is through working with contractors who are either private sector or uh, civil society organizations that are actually out in the field doing that work. Uh, so in a way, uh, that is absolutely critical to USAID's form of development assistance. PEPFAR, actually, the, um, the authorizing legislation for PEPFAR under uh, George W. Bush uh, and the work that they did with Congress then included a chapter on the importance of establishing public-private partnerships. And as a result, PEPFAR has had hundreds of uh, collaborations with, with the private sector over the years and the entire spectrum from prevention through care, treatment, and, uh, and the sustainability of the gains that we've seen through the PEPFAR program. And a lot of that has been through the private sector. The, the most important one of them probably is the, uh, the supply chain management partnership, which established a secure and efficient supply chain for all of the many drugs and other uh, tools that PEPFAR was making available to its partner countries. Uh, and that helped to create um, uh, pan-African players in third-party logistics and supply chain management uh, who are now helping to have an impact beyond just the PEPFAR program as well. But to come back to your, uh, you know, specifically to the question, um, I alluded to this at the end of my earlier intervention when I pointed out that, you know, all of the investments that are being made in global health actually by creating more prosperous and uh, more secure societies around the world are actually helping to uh, really reinforce and, um, uh, and help uh, make clear uh, just how important it is for U.S. security interests to continue these investments. 
uh, you know, because people, uh, you know, Greg alluded to this, um, you know, with the, in the case of Georgia that, you know, uh, in that case it was a political development that the Georgians were, were happy about. But, you know, uh, I've heard Mark Dybul, who was both the head of PEPFAR and the head of the Global Fund until recently, uh, you know, he's described going to African countries um, where people just, all the people he met wanted to say thank you to the United States for saving their lives and their families' lives from the scourge of HIV and AIDS. Um, and, you know, that kind of, um, of uh, development cooperation and assistance in, in global health is something that people don't forget. Um, and it, you know, I think having lived abroad myself, um, it really has an impact on how people think about the United States and look at the United States as a partner for what they want to accomplish with their lives and with their countries. And uh, so, you know, without sounding, uh, um, you know, I, I just think it's important to keep that in mind, that this leadership, um, which uh, is undeniably a position the U.S. holds now, the bipartisan uh, commitments that have led to that, uh, and the tremendous uh, work we've done for good around the world all help to make the world safer and therefore help to uh, reinforce the security interests the U.S. has. And it seems to me that's a very powerful argument for continuing those investments. Thank you. Randy, um, you're the world's largest global energy firm. You have a lot of issues on your mind. Um, I remember reading Steve Cole's book on the firm and being amazed at the magnitude and range of issues that confront any firm of this complexity and scope. So how, when you think about the picking the spots that you're going to pick and making, case, the, making the case to Congress or to an, a media or opinion leaders or others about what's important, how and when do you make the case for U.S. leadership on health? Where does this fit? Well, I think it's, uh, it's fundamental. Uh, again, if you employ people, you care deeply about health. Uh, and, and you think about the importance that the U.S. Has, uh, has provided on research, leading edge research, uh, well before businesses would be taking the kind of risk uh, in, in many areas. That, that, that has to continue. That, that leading edge research has to continue. And once you see that you're getting traction, that's where I think the private sector may actually be a much better place to complete and conclude, bring, bring that product to, uh, to the globe. But um, it, it, funding, funding leading edge research uh, is critical. Think tanks, I, I think uh, the U.S. providing coupled with, with this leading edge research think tanks for sharing, for uh, partnering and building these collaborative relationships that we've been talking about. And, and, and there's another factor. I, I think um, this is no time for U.S. arrogance in all of this. This is a time for respectful uh, uh, partnering. Uh, leading, I, I call it leading from behind. Uh, mm -hmm. Many times we're going to be far more effective by leading from behind. Think about the images in, on, uh, that all of us saw on, on the media during the 14-15 uh, Ebola crisis. We had these very elaborate, uh, uh, complex isolation capsules that we were using to transport people. But, but in West Africa, uh, it was largely contained in a, a closed room. I mean, as, as long as there was no touching. Uh, w one of our challenges was to uh, help people understand they have to stop touching for a while. If there's any doubt, stop touching. And, and the disease stops where it is. So that's just one small example. The, the solutions that we were providing when people were being transported for, for the important care that they needed back to the U.S., very, very different in West Africa. So le these solutions are important uh, to, to honor, leading, leading from behind. Thank you. Greg, tell us a bit about your own strategy at Gilead Sciences in terms of how do you make your voice heard to make the case for sustained U.S. leadership in this? Well, I think you need to start with what I said in my very first comments, which is I, I do believe there's, there's a moral imperative to do mm -hmm. something in, in, in countries around the world. And um, because we, we do have 
this amazing science that we have, and, and there are ways we can make it available um, in these countries. And the U.S. government role in that, I think, has come, has come through very clearly, is, is critical um, to making that happen. We can do a lot as the private sector. The um, activists and NGO communities can do a lot, but the government is, is critical. So um, I say that because it, it, I, I will, I, there's a lot of different reasons why we do this, and it will resonate with different audiences. But you know, one that we've really been talking a lot about is strategic health diplomacy. Mm -hmm. um, this is a, a term that was coined by Tom Daschle and Bill Frist in the paper that they wrote for the Bipartisan Policy Center. And it really makes the case that the standing of the U.S. globally and our ability to be a leader globally um, is greatly improved by the work that we do in healthcare. And they cite some statistics in the reports. For example, the World Bank shows that um, in the countries where PEPFAR has been active, um, corruption and violence has been reduced by roughly 40% versus about 3% in, in similar non-PEPFAR countries. Um, so it's in the same report, they're showing a Gallup poll in terms of the reputation of the U.S. And, um, in PEPFAR countries, about 68% of the, the countries have a positive Im image of the U.S. versus less than 50% globally. Um, this was in, in, I think, 2014. So there are some very good arguments that we do gain a lot in terms of our standing globally by doing, um, you know, doing good work, by doing things for people that is, in a sense, selfless. It looks like, you know, um, you know, we are really caring about people. And I think as, as, as um, Jeff said, you know, it is appreciated. Um, you know, I, I mentioned the, the, the Ronald Reagan statue and the George Bush Highway in Georgia, but they, they love America and they love what we're doing in this, in this um, elimination program for hepatitis C. And we've had the prime minister um, award our, our chairman um, for, for doing that work. I mean, they, are, they, they, they really get the importance of this. And I think we can, but I think there's just so much more we can do. We need, I think continuing the, what we're doing, I think one other thing I, I always recommend our government do is publicize this better. Is I, I think that the, there's a, a better opportunity for the U.S. citizens to be more proud of the role that they are playing in, mm -hmm. in global health, whether it's through tax, tax dollars uh, to support PEPFAR or through the research we do at NIH or through the funding through our university systems. We, we have a lot to be proud of, and I don't think people understand what we do globally. I think that would actually be valuable there. But then I think we also need to publicize internationally a little bit more as well. I think that there are a number of countries around the world where we have a lot of challenges that probably don't really appreciate fully what we do in terms of whether it's USAID or a PEPFAR or support for Global Fund. And I think we can do a lot more of that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's open to the floor. We'll bundle together a number of comments um, and questions. And please be very succinct and offer a single um, intervention. Why don't we come down here? We'll start over on this side. There's two hands up. Um, hi there, um, my name is Arush Lal. I'm with InterHealth International and the Frontline Health Workers Coalition. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for um, the really invigorating panel and thank you, Jeff, for highlighting um, you know, the role that InterHealth and private sector partners played in Senegal um, in that contraceptive project you were mentioning. I think it really highlights the, catal the catalytic role private sector can have in a low middle income country. Um, my question really is based on, uh, kind of predicated on the fact that it's important to note that we are in a global workforce crisis. Um, WHO you know, reminds us that there's going to be an 18 million health workers shortage by about 2030. Um, so I'm interested to know how your companies have uh, you know, relied on that. I know, Randy, you mentioned that um, you kind of alluded to this when you said that there's a lack of primary care facilities in West Africa. Uh, what are some of the ways that your companies are working to help train health workers in these areas? And also some ways that you can kind of work to ensure that the public health projects that you are, um, you are helping fund and, and provide for are providing more resilient health systems to provide long-term impact in those communities. Thank you. Thank you. Right behind you. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity. I'm Dr. Krishna from uh, George Washington University and the president of Indo-US Brain Trust. I'd uh, like to take this opportunity to thank uh, Greg and the Claudio for a very uh, good uh, uh, program which you introduced as a business model in, in, in India uh, on hepatitis C. And I believe you are also working on HIV uh, model uh, uh, is really great and uh, my question is uh, what uh, actually uh, I heard that you are going to have a state and government and the GLIAT partnership for eradicating the hepatitis C 
from India. And your business model actually is a very uh, extensive global model in which the Indian pharmaceutical company can cover the 176 country to uh, give, provide the medicine for hepatitis C. I would like to uh, you. request you to just mention more things to the audience because it's a very good business model. Thank you. We had a few hands over here. And then back here. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Hernan Rosenberg. I, previous incarnation, I was in WHO and the Global Fund. Uh, now I'm working with the Global Health International Advisors. Um, two points. One is the, the health systems generally have not just the provision of services, but also have insurance and they have uh, financing. And of course, the nature of the guests preclude us from talking, but I think there is a role for the private sector in these other aspects as well which I think if somebody cared to talk about that. And the other point that I would like a little bit developed is uh, in this uh, sort of sometimes uncomfortable dance between the global uh, governance of health at the public sector with the private. Uh, we ha have a newest animal called FEMSA, you know, the uh, framework for engagement of the non-sector, uh, of non-state actors of, the, of WHO. So if somebody cared to talk a little bit, how you see that affecting or not whatever has been said before. Thank you. Thank you. Right here, please. Uh, yes, thank you. My name is Dr. Mindy Reiser. I've worked in developing countries. The question is to Randy. Um, in terms of broader public health issues, of course, uh, ExxonMobil is involved <clears throat> in oil exploration and oil production. Can you say a little bit about the scrutiny of the effect on environmental health, people who are exposed <coughs> to your work when you work in oceans? Uh, are you looking at the impact on the fish, on the ecology? I think that would be helpful to hear as well. Thank you. We'll take a fifth question. Yes, right here. Hi, Emily Kaufman, Population Services International. Um, thank you all for coming. It was really interesting. You began the panel talking about um, how global health has changed over the past 15 years and the importance of partnerships. So I was wondering if you might touch on how partnerships have changed over the past 15 years or how you would like to see them change in the next few. Thank you. Okay. Who'd like to jump in first here? Greg? Sure. Um, you want me to try to address all the questions? I no, you know. just, what, whichever <laughs> ones interest you. Okay, so the first question, I'll, I'll, in terms of what are we doing to, you mentioned health systems and, and the lack of healthcare providers, I'd say lack of clinics and other things. Um, we're doing, a, I'll just give you a couple examples of things, some things we're doing. Actually, in, in India, in Kolkata, um, we're working um, <coughs> with the uh, Indian uh, Liver Disease Society. And we've actually um, funded the build, building of a hospital um, that's, that's, that's really unique. Has, it has three floors. We talked a lot about differential pricing this morning. Mm -hmm. It's a differential pricing hospital where wealthy people occupy the top floor, middle income people occupy the middle floor, and then poor people get free care on the bottom floor. And it self-funds itself, and that's the model that we're working on there. Um, if that works, it'd be a great model to bring to other markets because, again, in India you have such differences in, in wealth, so that's one thing that we've worked on. We're also working in Tanzania um, in an, on an HIV product, project. Um, it's actually with the Vatican of, of all other um, organizations, but they, the Vatican has a very large um, a presence uh, in, in this region, a very, very remote region of Tanzania. And we're working with um, a couple NGOs, we're actually an NGO, as well as Chelsea Westminster, we have a physician coming from there. And the idea there is to create a hub and spoke model of care where we can, many of you heard of this, but you essentially have stations throughout the region where people can procure their medicine, but then you have a central place where you have the actual healthcare providers and we can um, scale up good quality care, we believe the, model, the, the, the theory is, scale up good quality care, um, reach a much broader um, range um, and broader population with fewer healthcare workers um, through, through this program. So, just thank you. Up. Randy. Yeah, so I, th I think first uh, dealing with the question on um, what are we doing as a company to uh, prepare uh, places like West Africa for healthcare and the shortages that exist today and are likely to, to uh, grow. Uh, what, what we do as a company is we, we find you have to get well in front of that and so we fund 
generously education and, and touching children. You, you've really got to touch children to make a difference. Get, get the science, get the math embedded very, very early. Uh, our, our company started this, uh, frankly, at the high school level. That wasn't early enough. We pushed it to middle school. That wasn't early enough. And so what we're finding is you've really got to reach deeply into uh, primary education or, or sooner to plant the seeds that, that they need so that they've got a, a desire, uh, a passion to go into the healthcare industry. That's the ultimate answer and that's where we put our, our money. We, we take steps in the near term to provide the care that we need today, but that isn't generating, I, I don't think it's getting to the question that you, that you were asking. On the uh, environmental impacts of, of health, uh, they're, they're huge, they're big. Uh, there's lots to be said about that. But I, but I would tell you that uh, wherever we operate, we take great care with uh, the, the wildlife, the water quality. Uh, are we having an impact? If we are, it needs to be a good impact. Think we we want to leave the area in better condition than when we found it. Um, I, I, I think you would be very pleased with uh, with where most of our employees are at on that, on that very question. They're, they're asking similar questions. Um, and you may have seen the announcement or earlier this week, we've made commitments to continue to reduce our methane, uh, 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 or, or to, to continue to grow our methane reductions and, and uh, minimize our carbon footprint. But that said, it gets back to operating and really understanding the impact that we're having locally. Culture of health, I, I mentioned culture of health. Uh, it's a very broad concept and it's, it's early in its life. We've, we've been uh, at the culture of health now three, maybe four years, and it gets deeper and, and richer the, the longer we're, we're learning from ourselves because it's a broad, broad top, topic. But uh, it's, a, it's a really good question with a, a long, long list of, uh, of answers. Jeff, you want to talk about FINSA? Sure. A uh, bit let me about the... Um, the workforce crisis as well. Sure, let me address those and also how, how partnerships have changed. Um, I mean, first on, on the global health workforce crisis, it's uh, absolutely true and, and thankfully through work like the Frontline Health Workers uh, Alliance and others, uh, we're beginning to see some movement on this, but there's still a massive gap between the number of health workers required in Africa and other parts of the world and those who can be trained in a, uh, a short period of time and actually put to work. So I think one of the things that we're finding is that much of the uh, work and partnerships that we've been talking about between the private sector and uh, NGOs and government is actually taking advantage of resources that the private sector can make available to help deal uh, in part with uh, the crisis in, in health workforce training. Um, you know, Greg uh, mentioned this morning, although he didn't mention today, a lot of the work in medical education that Gilead and other companies do, uh, you know, just to make sure that uh, health workers, nurses, um, clinical officers, doctors are aware of how to use the new products that are available for HIV or HCV and others. So that's important and, you know, there are tens of thousands of healthcare workers who are trained by these kinds of programs. There are also um, ways in which, you know, a company like Exxon, you mentioned you have 80 some clinics in the countries in which you operate around the world. Well, those clinics provide care not just for your employees and their families, but in some cases, um, as you uh, outlined in the uh, response to Ebola, you actually help in the communities as well. Uh, and that's certainly the case with, uh, with other companies who are involved in the Ebola outbreak. And also, if you look at, um, you know, one company, for example, um, Anglo-American, uh, which uh, uh, set up a, a network of clinics for its minors to deal first with HIV and AIDS and then with TB and then in the communities around the mines that Anglo-American had as well. Um, you know, these are ways in which uh, private sector resources can help deal with um, the need for additional health worker resources and to train those workers who are there. Uh, and then there are a lot of programs uh, where companies who uh, might be working with government and other partners, uh, for example, um, AstraZeneca has uh, developed a program that we uh, had uh, a little bit to do with uh, in its early stages called Healthy Heart Africa, which is operating in Kenya. And that is um, a collaboration between the government, uh, the national government, some of the county governments, um, five large NGOs in, uh, in Kenya and uh, the PEPFAR program and also with CDC uh, in which they have integrated the uh, blood pressure um, screening and diagnosis 
into services that were already being provided uh, through a network of thousands of clinics that PEPFAR had helped to build um, so that people who were coming to the clinics for HIV or for maternal and child health could also have their hypertension dealt with. Um, and then another component of that was that uh, AstraZeneca made available resources to work with their NGO partners to train community health workers who could actually help link people in the communities to the formal health system. And that was one of the biggest gaps that Kenya had in the counties in which they were operating. So those are some of the ways in which the partnerships we've been talking about can help address the need for um, a more resilient health workforce. And the, uh, that also gets at um, uh, the question that you posed about insurance and, uh, and financing. I could give examples of, you know, of ways in which the private sector is now becoming engaged. I'll just give two. One from Lagos, because uh, Randy was talking about Lagos, but you know, I, uh, when I was in Lagos a couple of years ago, I had an opportunity to go visit a managed care organization that had been uh, built from scratch, basically, as a way of adopting um, techniques that the Apollo healthcare system had been using in India to operate in the private sector in Lagos, so that they were actually running a very high quality managed care organization with community clinics that reached over 300,000 people, and it was all funded by the, uh, the subscriptions that people were providing uh, to belong to this managed care organization. So that's just one among thousands of examples uh, in lower and middle income countries where you're beginning to see this kind of um, private sector response to the gaps in, in the healthcare system. The other example is uh, what I'd use is the Abraj Emerging, Emerging Markets Health Fund, which um, raised a billion dollars from IFC and the Gates Foundation and several companies, um, including uh, Merck Sharp and Dome and, uh, and also um, from other investors, to create a fund that began investing in hospitals, uh, particularly in East Africa. So they now have a network of hospitals in e East Africa, which ultimately will be able to build a capitation-based model of providing care in their catchment areas, um, they're already reaching something like three million people, uh, and through this uh, investment in building um, a system that's fully integrated with the public sector system, uh, they're actually able to provide improved quality care at lower prices uh, and to many more people. That brings me finally to, um, uh, to FENSA, which stands for the Framework for non Engagement of Non-State Actors that was introduced at WHO recently. Uh, and part of the reason behind it was, it was perfectly understandable that, you know, because WHO is the central institution in global health policy, uh, literally uh, hundreds of organizations were coming to WHO and saying, let's partner on this or let's partner on that or we have a great deal for you, don't you want to work with us on this other thing? Uh, and so, you know, WHO uh, leadership just needed a way to cope with all of these requests for partnership. Um, and they, uh, I think the, the challenge, though, with the way that FENSA has emerged or, or finally was put in place is that, uh, and, you know, uh, we could have a long conversation about this, but I'll just make a, a statement, a categorical statement that I think it was based on a misconception about the role of interests uh, in the way in which global health operates. Because a core issue that was debated by the World Health Assembly about um, the FENSA um, framework was we have to avoid conflicts of interest. And the way that that debate went was that NGOs don't have conflicts of interest, they're just there to do good for the public. Governments surely have no conflicts of interest because they're there to manage the whole system. Uh, and the people we have to, and foundations don't have conflicts of interest because they have lots of money to give us, so that must be good. Uh, but the private sector, because they work for a profit, clearly have conflicts of interest and those have to be guarded against. Now, you know, I'm not here to say that there is no instance in which a private sector company may not have had some particular agenda of its own that might not have been fully aligned with the WHO, but I think the fallacy at the core of this is that not to acknowledge that everybody in every organization has interests. Uh, and the best way to manage those is to acknowledge them, be transparent about them, uh, and then see if you can agree on, without having to agree on everything, without having to understand everybody's motivation, you can actually agree on one thing that you might think is actually worth doing together, uh, and then you can f define a way of collaborating on achieving that one goal uh, that actually is open and is uh, you know, in, in the public interest uh, and actually does provide benefits for everybody involved. 
And then having done that, you can work on the next thing and the next thing and then build trust so that there's uh, a much broader collaboration than there would be. So I think uh, to the extent that FENSA makes it possible for WHO to define partnerships and to work uh, with a, a broad range of organizations, it's a good thing. I hope that in practice um, it gets beyond this, uh, this asymmetrical view that there are only some parties who have interests at stake uh, and has a much more sophisticated understanding that uh, we all have interests in some way and, and the thing to do is to focus on what we're trying to do together in the interests of improving health uh, and uh, try to find all the resources and uh, partners we can uh, to do a better job of achieving those goals. Jeff, um, on the fence up issue, and there's been an enormous amount of frustration um, over the last several years in that process. Um, and I think frustration uh, very much on the private sector side. As Tedros, Dr. Tedros Adhanom was elected the new director general, um, there was a lot of discussion around carrying forward long overdue internal reforms. There's been a very promising dialogue begun between uh, Secretary Price and his office and, 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 and the director general's office that I think is very healthy and, and there's been an affirm affirmation of the central value of WHO and of the U.S. support of WHO, but it's all tied together with an expectation that these reforms will be carried forward. And I'm assuming that that includes trying to break through some of the deadlock around dealing with private sector interests. Do you believe that? Do you think that's true? I, well, I think, you know, I have uh, no more uh, privileged insight into these issues than anyone else here. Um, you know, I've, I've had an opportunity to talk to Dr. Tedros, but, uh, you know, I don't have any, uh, he hasn't confided in me what he's actually <laughs> planning to do. But, uh, but, you know, I think that if you just um, listen to what he's been saying and look at the way he's been operating since he's come into office in the summer, um, you know, he clearly understands, uh, well, he said quite clearly that universal health coverage is his top priority. Um, and I think that anyone who looks at the challenges that the governments of the world face and the WHO faces in supporting them in achieving universal health coverage, um, it's evident that it's going to have to be all hands on deck, that you know, there, isn't an, there aren't enough resources or expertise in government alone to solve the problem. Uh, and we're going to have to work with civil society and the private sector together uh, to find ways to address the individual challenges that countries are going to face to reach universal health coverage. Um, and so he's been quite clear also that I think, uh, you know, at, at the heart of his vision of achieving universal health coverage, uh, that it's going to be a collaborative uh, endeavor. Uh, and, you know, the, the, um, the major issue for WHO reform is to figure out what they're not going to do as much as what they will do. So I think that's one of the issues that he has. Uh, but you know, to, to my mind, um, you know, he's had a terrific start by being very clear about what his highest priority is uh, and beginning to sketch out how he'll try to work that way with you know, a very unwieldy organization that doesn't have enough money and has, er you know, I, I think um, in a different context, uh, people have observed that any problem in global health is laid at his door and any success somebody else takes credit for. So, you know, it's in a way a thankless task, but, you know, but he's been very successful before in his role both as health minister at e in Ethiopia and as foreign minister, so, um, so I wouldn't bet against him. I want to, if I can just take one more second, I didn't respond to the question about how have partnerships changed, and you reminded me about this when you asked uh, about FENSA. You know, when um, I mentioned that anecdote of going to WHO Euro, you know, some 20 years ago to talk about collaboration, and they thought I was from Mars, um, you know, I had similar experiences around the same time of trying to define a way to work together with, uh, with UNAIDS or work together with WHO in Geneva or here in, uh, in Washington with PAHO. And it was always the same response. Gee, well, that's, that's an interesting question. Nobody's ever asked us that before. <laughs> and, you know, and what is it you really want from us? You know, there was just um, mistrust and, and suspicion based largely on not having had the experience of working together. What's true now, 20 years later, is that every multilateral organization has an office devoted to creating partnerships. You know, if you just uh, think about it, uh, you know, WHO certainly, you know, has an entire, um, uh, had an entire strategy about private sector collaboration before FENSA came on, on board. UNICEF, UNAIDS, uh, 
WIPO, uh, just about every multilateral organization I can think of has, an, uh, has a group, UNDP has a group devoted to strategic partnerships. The same thing's true with almost every large NGO uh, that's out there. Uh, and also, as I said, um, the other thing that's new now is that the U.S. government, uh, through the examples I gave of USAID and PEPFAR, you could also talk about the Millennium Challenge Corporation, you could talk about a number, of CDC has, uh, you know, has its own uh, 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 devotion to partnerships, uh, the Fogarty International Center at NIH is, its raison d'etre is international partnerships to uh, improve both uh, clinical capabilities in, in other countries as well as um, uh, here at home. So uh, that's a big change, that now it's no longer a question of should we create partnerships, it's who are the right partners and what are the issues that we should be working on. Uh, but it seems to me that it's no longer um, a controversial question about whether these kinds of partnerships make sense. Uh, it's just an issue of uh, how to structure them and how to manage them. Thank you. Uh, we're towards the end here. What I'm going to do is ask, starting with Greg, Randy, back to Jeff, for just a closing, closing remark, brief closing remark about you know, what are we likely to be talking about five years from now when we ask the question, how exactly does health matter to you and your operations? What do start well, with how, you, how health, health, health matters to me in my operations is easy because that's what we do, so. But how <laughs> specifically, what are you going to be talking about at that point? You know, you. I hope you, we're you, talking about more successes like what we've done in HIV, I think what, we're, what we've started in hepatitis C, but I think really, really tell, ask, you know, taking on the challenge of how do we bring more newer innovations into um, developing countries around the world. Mm -hmm. how, how do we, how do we ta ta tackle the challenges of, um, you know, obviously affordability of the medicines, but the healthcare providers and others. Um, but I, th I actually think we're on a pretty good path because I think the partnerships today, I, I didn't answer the question, we're partnering a lot more than we ever did. I didn't answer your question about what we're doing with the states in India, but I think the industry is out there and we're being very um, creative, we're being very, and it's not, it's, I guess not just us, um, open to working with a number of different actors that historically we never did. And I think this ideally will result in just really improved health in, in the countries around the world that we care about. Randy, what do you think ExxonMobil is likely to be talking about? I, I think, think that we'll, uh, you know, it's, it's impossible for me to predict which disease, which virus we, we might be talking about at the, at the time. But I do think some themes will be common. I, I, I think that there will be uh, urgent needs. And I think the way you deal with crises is together. I, I think that there'll be uh, more need to collaborate than ever before. And what I'm excited about, though, is that as uh, developing countries' economies strengthen, as their education levels uh, improve, that's going to get faster. I think our cycle time will be faster. I think we'll be able to get in, get in front of the issue sooner and stay there longer. So I'm very uh, optimistic mm -hmm. that uh, uh, we'll be able to, to uh, work our way out of trouble uh, mm -hmm. easier than perhaps we have in the past. Mm -hmm. I mean, I expect that you're going to have a smaller pool of lower, lower income countries and a bigger pool of lower middle income countries. Uh, poverty will continue to evolve in different forms. And I would think also that uh, chronic diseases will be hitting us over the head in a, in a much bigger way than and they're already hitting us over the head today, but the, the magnitude and the visibility will be quite different. Jeff? You know, I certainly agree with, uh, with those comments and with what Greg and Randy said. I think in, in a way what we'll be talking about five years from now depends on decisions that are made now. Um, you know, we'll, in five years we'll be halfway toward 2030 uh, from when the Sustainable Development Goals were adopted by, by the UN. Uh, and so if we continue to make the kinds of investments in global health that the U.S. government has led in over the past several years, uh, and if uh, as a result of that other governments, other bilateral donors continue to make those investments and we continue to see the sorts of partnerships that we've been talking about this afternoon, uh, then I think um, it'll be a, a fairly optimistic picture because we will make continued progress against the AIDS epidemic, the malaria deaths will continue to decline, 
Uh, under five, childhood mortality will continue to decline to historically low levels. Maternal mortality will continue to decline. Uh, and we'll be able to see a world in which uh, more people are able to live healthy and productive lives, which will be good for all of us. If, on the other hand, uh, the um, plateau in global health investment that we've seen over the last couple of years uh, turns into a, a precipitous decline, then a lot of the gains that we've seen will be erased. Um, you know, the HIV epidemic will come roaring back. You know, the virus is just looking for an opportunity. Um, you know, we'll see uh, that some of the other um, uh, progress that we've made in other major conditions uh, uh, will uh, will take a step back. Um, and, uh, and, and also, um, you know, if we don't continue the kind of work that the global health security agenda has done to uh, do a better job of preventing, detecting, and responding to emerging infectious disease threats, um, then the next Ebola outbreak may not be um, a better story. It may be that we'll be just back to uh, the kind of, of chaos that we saw in, in 2014, 2015. So, you know, I, you know, like Randy, I'm optimistic. I'd like to think that the glass is half full and that um, the progress that we've made becomes an argument in favor of continuing that progress. Uh, and I think, you know, we've given some good examples this afternoon of how working, governments working together with the private sector and civil society are able to really uh, transform the way in which uh, healthcare is managed uh, and, and experienced around the world. Uh, but unless we in, uh, really um, internalize this notion of a culture of health that, uh, that Randy was talking about, you know, health occurs where we live, work, learn, and play. It's not just something imposed on us from outside. Uh, and it means that everybody uh, has a stake in improving global health. Uh, and uh, as long as the kinds of examples that we've talked about continue and those investments continue, then I think uh, I'd be optimistic about the next five years. Thank you very much. Um, I want to offer a special thanks, tribute to my colleague, Chris Millard, who put this all together. Thank you, Chris. And again, thanks to Courtney Gillespie and our friends from Gilead Sciences for their generous support, and to Jim and Dina uh, and Randy from uh, ExxonMobil for making the di coming the distance to be with us today. Uh, and Jeff, as always, uh, a great friend and ally and fellow with us here at CSI. So please join me in thanking these three. Thank you. Thank you.